Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us all come together to worship you. Lord, please speak to us through Mr. Gary. Help us to take in today's lesson and use it to grow your kingdom. Please be with those on the prayer list and help those who are suffering from COVID. In Jesus, your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Connor. Morning, church. Certainly happy to see you today. Our numbers are down a little bit. Don't know why that is. Maybe I'm running people off. Uh, we have four elders. I noticed we have one elder here today. I've started at the top with running them off. <laughs> oh, boy. Had a meet with the elders last week after church, and uh, they didn't fire me. So I don't know what it could be. Maybe it's just the COVID, the weather. I tell you what, when it's dark and rainy and all that, it sure is easy to sleep in, ain't it? I told Rhonda, I'm going to sleep in today. She said, you got to preach. Oh, I said, I can phone it in. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was happy to, uh, to be here with all of you today. A uh, couple of announcements. Children's Church, <laughs> I think we have one today. And he's already gone back, right? Good, good, we have that. Another announcement, though, is, uh, and it's in your bulletin, Ladies' Day at Niceville Church. Um, ladies, encourage you to look into that. Uh, usually it's very nice, very nicely done over there. I know uh, Rhonda and Billie Jean have already signed up to be there. And, and now it's been postponed till April. So this was just an early announcement for April for all of you. I, I'm the last one to ever know about anything around here. So uh, come back in April for their ladies' day. Rhonda told me to announce this, okay? <laughs> and um, those are my only two announcements other than this. So... We're at the beginning of the year, and, uh, you know, I, so, so, some have asked, where do you come up with your sermon thoughts and ideas? How do you do this? How do you do that? And, and everything. And, and there's a huge scientific way I go about doing all of this, okay? You wouldn't understand, actually, unless you'd been to college to understand how technical this actually is, putting together sermons. So I won't go into that, but I will say this. Uh, I have uh, some sermon series already I'm working on for this year, some different things. Uh, I've, I've been your preacher for a little over a year now, and um, I've, I've put together some different thoughts and ideas. People say, when's your sermon complete? It is never complete. I will watch sometimes my sermons, and I'll say, I should have said this different. I should have done that differently. I could have added this or taken away that. And so it's never really done. However, on Saturdays is when everything must come together and gel. And, uh, and I'm still working on it. And then I get the slides to David, get the scripture, John McFarland. There's a lot that goes into, into all of this. But nevertheless, I try to look ahead to where we are going. And I, and I work on different sermon series. And as I said, I have several things I'm working on this year. And we even have a couple things for next year, 2023. But um, today, I want to share with you kind of a teaser, I guess, uh, for what I'm starting the first Sunday of, of February, which I believe is the 6th. So two more weeks uh, in this month, and, uh, and then uh, the first Sunday of February, which is the 6th, which we'll be starting a, um, a sermon series. Vaughn, do you have that uh, video you can run for us? I think there's so many opportunities. I don't know how I would grow otherwise. When I see what God's done in my life and in the life of others, it makes me excited to see what He will do in the future. I see this as a way to take the love that God has shown me and show it to my church, to my community, and that is so rewarding. One of the things that I hope actually pray about is what it would look like if we as believers really came alongside of our friends and told them where our hope comes from. Why our faith may 
makes a difference in our life. Why do we go to church? Why um, is Jesus central to our life? I love my church. I love my church. We love our church. Just a little something I put together yesterday. <laughs> so, starting in February, we'll have five week series. I love my church. And uh, I would encourage you to be here. I would also encourage you, and I always encourage you to invite guests. But uh, sometimes, if, if you think, well, sometimes people are afraid to invite guests. Well, I don't know what the preacher's liable to say, you might step on their toes. Um, you should know me by now. I, if, if, if toes are being stepped on, it's not Gary, it's the Lord, and that's okay. But I don't ever come in here putting down other faith groups or anyone else. I teach what I believe the Bible teaches and let that speak for itself, okay? So I encourage you, I encourage you to invite people uh, to come and, and let's talk about loving our church. That's loving one another, our church. And, and I think that uh, you, I think that uh, your guests, if you invite them, uh, will be very happy that they've come. I, I believe it'll be filled, they'll be filled with the Spirit coming here. And let's talk about loving our church, okay? Amen. Do your heads this way. Agree with me. Okay, I'm pretty excited about this, actually, and you guys are not reflecting that excitement. And, and uh, Ron even told me, you know, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I don't know when you've been so excited about a, a sermon series. I said, yeah. I said, well, I am this one. Um, and and uh, I, I want you to come and be a part of it. Um, if you'd like a shirt like this, um, send me $50 per shirt. I'm kidding. You can actually order these online. If you'd like a shirt, get with me afterwards and I'll tell you where to go. So that is what is coming, church. And I am excited about it, uh, as I hope you are. And we're going to have that five-week lesson, five-week series on I Love My Church. So today, um, today we're going to be looking at several scriptures and talking about some things that I, I hope you find interesting as, as I did. Probably something a lot of you already know anyway. In fact, I would imagine most of my lessons are simply a reminder. Or maybe, oh, I remember that. I remember that story. Or sometimes, wow, you know, I didn't realize that verse was in the Bible. That's happened to me before. And so we're going we're gonna to look at a few things today that I think you'll find helpful. So, have you, and, and I don't know when the last time this has happened, but used to, we would get a lot of mail from Publishers Clearinghouse, some sweepstakes, uh, Reader's Digest, uh, Good Housekeeping sweepstakes. Y'all remember those? You know, you, you, you can win all this money. They, they, they offer it where, where, they, where they're telling you, uh, all you got to do is fill this out and send it back in. You could win a substantial prize. In fact, you've already won. You have won. All you got to do is send this in. And you get all giddy and excited and say, <laughs> I have won. Yes. Apparently, it's been a very effective way to advertise because at one point it helped at least one company generate upwards of one, nearly one and a half million dollars, one and a half million subscriptions every year at a very low cost. Because all you got to do is fill out this stuff here, subscribe to this, but you've already won. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of who all sent those things back in and got a subscription because I don't want to embarrass you. I never did. Rhonda did. No, I'm just kidding. We never sent those back in. In 1997, 
American Family Publishers had a mailing list that included the Bushnell Assembly of God, the church here in Florida. Bushnell, Florida. The computer somehow twisted the name of the church and the sweepstakes notice was addressed to God of Bushnell. And it was sent to the church's address. The letter read, Dear God, we're searching for you. You've been positively identified as our $11 million mystery millionaire. What an incredible fortune that would be for you, God. Imagine the looks you'd get from your neighbors. But don't just sit there, God, come forward now and claim your prize. These folks were searching for God. They, they, they promised God a huge blessing if only God would respond to their offer. Now, let me tell you, our text today came from Romans uh, chapter 12, Brandon read for us. And it's telling us that God has offered a huge blessing, and not just for one lucky winner, but for every one of us. Be transformed by the renewal of your minds. And by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God. You may discern. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God. Discernment. I, I like that word. You know, uh, I had a friend of mine tell me one time, older preacher friend, mentor, and I agree with him. He said, you know, I think one of the best things I could ever teach my children is discernment. Basically, the ability to make a good decision. Would you like to know God's will for your life? I'm sure that you would. And if you're searching for God's will for your life, you want His blessings, you need to respond to His offer. And God says you can do that by being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember that. Remember that. Now, how do we do that? How do we renew our minds? You know... It, it means we need to change the way we think. Let me say that again. It, it means we need to change the way we think. Preacher, what's wrong with my thinking? Well, sometimes it's stinking thinking. It's no good. We need to change the way we think. Many people, many people start out by believing that their personal opinion is the basis of truth. Barna Group, which you probably sure have heard of, did a survey of a large sampling of Americans about 20 years ago, and they found that people are most likely to make their moral and ethical decisions on the basis of whatever feels right or is comfortable in a situation, whatever feels right. In other words, if folks think something's right, it must be right. They believe that it's just good old common sense. If I think this is right, then it must be right. The Bible says that's kind of a default way of thinking. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 Tells us don't lean on our own understanding. Don't lean on our own understanding. Why shouldn't we do that? Because you know I trust my instincts. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your, your path straight. Lean not on your own understanding. Well, preacher, what's wrong with my instincts? Well, because sometimes our instincts aren't good. Proverbs. 14, 
12 ones, there's a way which seems right unto a man. Basically, you know, it seems right to me, but the end is the way of death. It seems right to me. Have you ever read these verses? Let's go, well, let me, let's go to this next one here. Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. A fool? You know, why, why would trusting my own instincts or my own, my own mind here make me a fool? Well, well, let me tell you, Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us the reason, the, or excuse me, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? As I was working on this and putting it together, I couldn't help but think of God relating to me as like when I was growing up, my parents relating to me. I, 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 I've jokingly said before, and I say jokingly, but when I was 16, I, I knew everything. Yeah, there was nothing I didn't know at 16. And my parents tried so hard to teach me things and... Let, they wanted me to listen to them and all, but you know, I was 16, and man, I had the world by the tail. I had it going on, man, anything you wanted to know, and it was black and white. There's no gray areas. It's black and white. Then as I get older, then I realize, you know, maybe my folks weren't so dumb, because I thought those two people were about the dumbest folks I'd ever met in my life. And then as you start having children, you hear yourself telling your children the same thing your folks told you, and your children aren't listening to you just like I wasn't listening to my parents. Did any of you go through that? Y'all are looking at me like, wow, Gary, you were about dumb, weren't you? Yes, I was. I thought I knew things, and I didn't want to listen to instruction from my parents who loved me more than life itself and would never do me bad would never do me wrong only had only only had my best interest at their heart now let's look at God God has our best interest at heart and here he's telling us look don't lean on your own understanding listen to me you know, what is the will of God? Well, let's follow our instincts. Well, maybe not. Let's, how about we follow the Bible? I don't know if I've told this story before, but if I have, forgive me. Of uh, A man and woman came in one time for marital counseling. They've been married a few years, young couple. And um, anyway, she was having an affair with someone and and then you know a lot of times I'd meet with them together sometimes separately and I met with her and we talked and finally she said well chaplain let me tell you this it I know it's the will of God because it just feels so right you know it made me a little angry that she was saying almighty God my God would ever be telling her that it's okay for her to leave her husband and go with this other guy. But it feels so right. Don't let your feelings fool you or your instincts fool you. Go to what the Word of God says. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Follow the Word of God. Follow the Word of God. And if your instinct is going against what the Word of God says, your instinct is wrong. It is wrong. Yeah, but I know, but, but see, God, God wrote all this stuff. I mean, it's thousands of years ago. You, it's still wrong. Go with God. You know, something's sometimes wrong inside of us. Something sometimes causes us to make poor choices. I have made poor choices in my life. I look back and I wish I would have listened to my parents on more things. I did listen to them on some things. My parents had told me and encouraged me to join the Air Force. 
My dad had been drafted into the army. He says, Gary, please don't join the army. Um, it wasn't a good experience for him. He said, join the Air Force. Daddy ain't going to join the Air Force. And once again, my parents talked to me and said, well, Gary, you know, maybe get a trade. But if you join the Air Force, you get a trade and all like this because, Gary, you're not college material. And I agreed with them. I was not college material as far as college material goes, whatever that is. I think just being able to succeed in college because, y'all have heard me say, I was interested in two things, sports and girls, and not in that order. I got through uh, school. I did okay in, in high school and everything. And I listened to my parents, and I joined the Air Force. And I was glad that I did. And they were right. I was not college material. I did go to college and got better grades in college than I did in high school. By that time, I was married and wasn't playing any sports. So I got better grades. Listening to my parents. And like I said, I, I wish I would have listened to them more. And it's the same way with my relationship with God. I hate to say it, but sometimes, even especially younger, I didn't necessarily want to listen to what God, the Word of God said. Because it went against what I believe, what I thought, what my instincts were. And it went against what Gary's will was. The Bible tells us we can't fully trust our own instincts. It's like something's been shut off inside of us, and because of that, we end up depending on wrong information. So, about 16 years ago, I got an atomic clock. Y'all know what those are? Are you familiar with the atomic clocks? They set themselves. This is set by the, um, a clock out in Boulder, Colorado. Now, this is a big-time clock. This is the clock for the whole United States, and you can't just go in there and see it. I knew a guy that worked there, and we lived in Colorado, and he wasn't allowed to get anywhere around it, and he had a big-time job there, but they wouldn't let him around it. That clock is said to be so accurate, it will not gain a second or lose a second for 100 million years. Well, if you have an atomic clock, what actually happens is you have this clock that keeps the time set all the time. Daylight savings time, it automatically changes. And it's controlled by that clock out there through radio waves. It comes pre-programmed that it will pick up those radio waves. So whenever you have one of these clocks, you have to have, if you have it down in a cellar or something and it can't get the radio waves, it's not going to work for you. But I love this clock. Someone got me that on my 40th birthday as a gag gift because uh, it's big, huge with big old numbers on it. They said I was losing my eyesight, <laughs> but I love that clock, and it is at our house now. But here about a month or so ago, I noticed something. That clock and my phone did not have the same exact time. They were off by four minutes. I said my phone is jacked up. Because I know my atomic clock is accurate for 100 million years. So I said, let me look at my iPad. My iPad was also jacked up because it was off by four minutes. I said, Rhonda, let me see your phone. Her phone was jacked up. I knew my, phone, my, my clock could not be messed up. My clock was messed up. My clock lost that signal from its power source. It no longer had that signal coming on and it was messed up and it was continuing to lose time. It was deprived of the source of true time and until my clock is repaired it's going to continue to be off. You know, I think that's kind of what the Bible tells about us. There's a switch inside of us that's been shut off by our sin. 
Our heart is deceitful because our sin has cut us off from the source of truth. We, we, we've been shut off from the main network. We've been cut off from God. And the only way to turn the switch back on is to renew our minds. You see, God's thinking is different from our thinking. Isaiah 55, 8, 9, God tells us, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. God tells us pretty plainly there that He knows best. And just like children sometimes, even like I was, where, where I was growing up, becoming a young man, and, and, and my parents' thoughts weren't the same as mine, and their ways weren't the same as mine, and their thoughts weren't my thoughts, but you know what? Yeah, unless you come from a dysfunctional family, usually your parents' ways and thoughts are going to be different and probably better than yours because you don't see it all when you're that age. You don't realize the dangers. There's things you just don't see until you get older. So, we need to tie in to God's ways. We need to tie in to God's thoughts. Until we do, we'll always depend on our instincts rather than God's. We'll, we'll always end up messing things up. So church, let me ask you, how do you do that? The Bible. Very simple, right? The Bible. What do you mean? I got to read my Bible? Well, you know, I'd say that helps. You know, I'm not saying you go buy a Bible and and place it under your your pillow and, and let it infiltrate your brain like osmosis. Open the book. Open the book. And maybe even open the book more than once a week. You know, and I hate to tell you this because this is a slam on me and, and it's almost embarrassing. But one of the reasons I like preaching is it forces me to get into my Bible. And that's sad. I love teaching Bible classes. You know why? Because it forces me to get into my Bible. You know, there, 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 there's times there, well, well, I'll read later. I'll study later. I'll do this later. Uh, well, you know, I saw a, a neat sign quoting Romans chapter 12 today at a restaurant, so that's my Bible reading today. Okay. Hmm, maybe not. Yeah, preaching and teaching it forces me to get into the Word of God. Like I said, that's embarrassing for me to tell you that, but yeah, that's, that's the truth. So, church, let me tell you, get into your Bibles more than once a week. There was a study done recently by the Center for Bible Engagement. It was something that they called, something they discovered called the power of, of four. What they, what, what they found was if you're at church and the preacher says, turn with me to such such passage, that's good, but it will have little to no effect on how you think and behave. If on Monday you say, you know, I think I'll read the rest of the chapter, whatever it was the preacher wanted you to turn to, well, that still has little to no effect on your behavior or thinking. If you open it again on Tuesday, What they found was, well, there's still some change, but not much. But if you open your Bible a fourth time that week, it begins to have a dramatic effect on how you deal with loneliness, how you handle moral struggles, and it increases how often you share your faith with others. The study stated the lives of Christians who do not engage the Bible most days of the week are statistically the same as the lives of a non-believer. 
That was an interesting stat there, an interesting study that they did. What they're saying, church, is God's Word can't change us if we don't read it, if we don't study it. Bible advises us to be like newborn babies who desire the pure milk of the Word that you might grow thereby, 1 Peter 2, 2. You know, if you're like us, your children are small, you bought them books. I don't know why we bought little ones books, but we did because all they did was chew on them. We had lots of mushy books in our house, but they chew on them. And I kind of think this is what God's talking about here. You know, as, 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 as Christians, as newborn Christian spiritual babies, God wants us to kind of gnaw on His book. God told Joshua in Joshua uh, chapter 1, verse 8, Book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. You know, here's God promising Joshua, if he's faithful in focusing on the written scriptures, he's going to receive blessings and he's going to receive success. I think that shows how important God's thinking is and God's views on us reading the Bible. Sometimes people will say, you know, I don't know about that. Let me chew on it for a while. Kind of the same thinking there. God wants us to do that. God wants us to chew on His Word. I love it when people come to me and say, You know what, Gary? I read something today and I don't think I've ever seen that in my Bible before. Well, good. That's growth, man. That's good stuff. Show it to me. And if you just read the Bible, is that enough? You know, I've been talking about God's will, studying God's will and all that, and talking about read the Bible, right, up to this point. Is that where we begin? No, it's not. What do you mean, Gary? Preacher, what are you talking about? Should we be reading our Bible? Yeah, you should. But let's not begin there. You see, 111th Psalm, verse 10 Wisdom begins, begins, begins with the fear of the Lord. I've always been taught fear here, meaning fear, reverential awe and respect. Fear of God, reverential awe and respect. So listen to me here. I know atheists who have read the Bible through many times. But it hasn't changed them, it hasn't changed their personality, it hasn't changed their worldviews. Why is that? They've read the Bible so many times. Preacher, that's what you're telling me, right? I should read the Bible. Why haven't these atheists been changed? Because, because they did not enter into the Bible, into Bible study, with the fear of the Lord. As the old saying is, they know the Bible, they don't know the author. It is just simply another book to them. Just another book. No God. There's no wisdom. Romans chapter 10. Verse 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. See, the atheist doesn't believe. You know, when we confess the Lord, what we're saying is, Lord, you own me. I give my life to you. You own me, Lord. And then I'll have a renewal of my mind. I've turned over my way of thinking to God. I place His priorities over my priorities. Church, let me tell you, these things are difficult. Changing our ways of thinking are difficult. And I'm thinking the older we get, the more difficult that is. 
We need to be resilient in our thinking. We get so tied in and we, to our way of thinking, we, that becomes our basis of truth, and we don't want to change that way of thinking. There are people that obey God only if they agree with Him. If the Bible says something they're not comfortable with, they ignore it. They treat God's written word as if it's suggestions they can ignore. Not a book of commands, but a book of suggestions. Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What I talked about earlier, right? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Is there a yardstick then to measure how you've been renewed? Is the yardstick based upon how much I read the Bible? No, I don't think so. Reading the Bible is vital to accomplish that, but it really the yardstick of having matured in my thinking. Is the yardstick that I've decided God's always right and that I should obey Him in all things? Well, yeah, it can be, but... But I think here, here's the deal. I've known lots of churchgoers who have read the Bible faithfully. Listen to me, church. I, I've known lots of, faith, of churchgoers that have read the Bible faithfully and have worked hard at obeying all the rules that they see in the Bible. They're not very nice people. In fact, sometimes they can be downright ugly and mean. Yeah, but they read their Bible, preacher. I know. And, and they look at all these rules. Yeah. <laughs> you see, there's something missing with that. Reading the Bible is great. Trying to follow the Lord faithfully is great. But when your whole life just comes down to reading the Bible to check a box and follow some rules to check a box, you're missing something. Church, you know what? Let me put it plainly. You're missing the Holy Spirit. You're not allowing the Holy Spirit to change your life, to change your mind. Preacher, does the Bible say that? Well, let me see. Galatians 5, 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit. So reading the Bible's good. Fearing the Lord, Great. Walking by the Spirit is absolutely amazing. Galatians. On down spells it out a little bit better, church. We studied these a few months ago. The fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What, what, what's that? If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. That's Galatians 5, 22 through 26. Reading God's Word, fearing God, walking with the Spirit. I think those are the measuring rods of our faith. Do we love others? Are we patient with others? Are we kind to them? Are you an undercover Christian? Do people know you're a Christian? Hey, if you get you a shirt like this, be kind to people, okay? <laughs> I, 
I didn't get Destin Church of Christ put on the back of this. I could have, but I wasn't sure if I could be kind to everybody all the time when I was wearing it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Patient with people, kind to people, compassionate to people, loving people. People are so hard to deal with sometimes. Let God transform your life. A couple of things here as we close today. First one is, through the Spirit, something... I, I don't know if we'll ever get completely right with the fruit of the Spirit. I think this is an ongoing process of self-control, of goodness, of kindness, of patience. I don't know, I don't think we could ever hit all of those and finally one day say, I have mastered the fruits of the Spirit. Because once you do, once you do, then you're all prideful. <laughs> and that's not good. Fruits of the Spirit. I don't know if we'll ever get it completely right. But those are goals that we shoot for in our lives. Because more of these things we have in our lives, more of God's Spirit we'll have. This is how you get to know God's will for your life. So church, let me tell you. First off is, if you don't belong to our Lord, you won't have any of this. You know that? If you're not a Christian, you won't have any of this. You're not going to have it. Lord invites you to come to Him. To become a Christian. To put Him on in baptism, to be saved, to live eternally in heaven. That's what God wants for us. God's a lot smarter than what we are. God loves us so much, we can't even fathom it. He wants us to come home. Church, we do offer our invitation for you today. And if you have questions about being a Christian or becoming a Christian or the Christian life, we have a class for you right after our worship back there that Von Plonk teaches. Teaches us on how to get to heaven. Very basic class on loving God and going to heaven. Church, if there's other things that, that, that we can do for you, no, you don't have to publicly respond this morning to our invitation. But if you want to get with me later or one of the elders, you can do that. Guest, if there's something that you need while you're down here, call on us. You have our phone numbers in the, in, on the back of the bulletin. Call on us. We're your church. Church, if there's anyone here today subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing.